Lord. Okay, let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you tonight, and above all else, we want to exalt you. We want to give you the glory, the praise, and the honor. You've created all things. You've sustained all things by the word of your mouth, and we praise you that it's your Son by whom you do these things, Father. We want to, to lift him up. We want to give him glory um, as he stands and sits at your right hand and mediates for us as our king, our prophet, and our priest, Father. May our time tonight be profitable. May we see a vision of him in, in, in the life of our church as we look at the life of other churches, Father, in Revelation chapter 2. We also ask forgiveness of our sins, and we thank you for the the blood of Jesus that covers them. Um, I just also want to pray right now in a special way for um, Atilani's family, um, for Nanai, and also for um, uh, for uh, uh, her sister. Um, her name escapes me, but Father God, I just pray that you would be with um, her family right now in a special way. We ask that the peace that passes all understanding would fill their heart, especially for Nanai who's str uh, struggling. Um, we also pray for, for Luigi and just uh, this decision that he made. Um, we know that, that there's, there's a time for, for work. There's also a time for, for rest and re for reflection. Father God, I pray that your spirit would, would fill him with your love, that he would Feel your presence. We know we know um, in our minds that you are present with us, but sometimes we don't feel your presence, Father. So I pray that your your Spirit would would be uh, um, present and that He would feel it in a special way, Father God. Fathers, we study your Word. We ask that your Spirit would be with us, that it would transform our hearts, conform us to the image of your Son, and we ask that we would grow in faith together as individuals, as families, and as a church. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things and trust in him. We love you and him with all our heart. Amen. Okay, so I, we're, we're continuing in our study in Revelation, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and screen share. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. It's also on the top of it in, in your screen. I'm going to go ahead and read that to us. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. I have a few things against you, though. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So, uh, pro perhaps probably the most challenging and uh, maybe strongest language that we've seen so far at the church to Ephesus, there was some language of rebuke and warning here. It seems to be much stronger. And so let's go ahead and let's, let's work through this, this text together. And so um, what I'll do is I'll just break this out for us. So let's look at verses Let's look at verse 12, and let's make observations about verse 12, and especially in relationship to what we've already seen. Uh, if you recall from our previous, so from our previous studies, let's go ahead and let's look at verse number 12. What are things that are 
to say maybe stick out to you that, that seem to be similar from the previous context? What, what are some different things? Maybe, maybe you have a question that you might have. Right. Okay, good. So, um, great. Was that Noel? I mean, was that, was that Raul? Yes, sir. Nice. So this is a command, right? There's a pattern. So, there is a pattern there. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Luigi. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, that's all I wanted to say. There's a, there's a pattern similar to the other, the other two churches that they started off with. So Luigi mentioned this, this pattern. That's, that's really, if you look, if you do, if you look at how many times there's been, this has been referenced many times. This has been stated many times. If we do a, a word count, uh, it's a lot, probably at least, at least five or six times already. So there's, this has been restated many times. And so there is significance here in that, the, you know, I tell my daughter to do something or I tell someone to do something. If you really want it done right, or maybe, in, in, maybe let's, let's use a parallel example at work, right? You just ask someone to do something, but if you really, it's really important to you, you send the email, right? Is everyone tracking with me there? It's like the next level. It's like you write it down so that there's a history, there's no debate what was said, what was called to do. And so I, there is huge significance here with this command, not just to tell the church, but to actually write it down. And so people go back and forth, they ask about the importance of the written word of God. And it's actually qu quite important for us. And so we believe not just in God's verbal words, but more importantly, his, the, the, the written word. Is there a description of Jesus here? Yes, they're using another description. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Yes. So, 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 uh, I think I heard Louis, Luigi. Luigi, what, what's the description? Who has the sharp two-edged sword? Yeah. So this is the description of. The one, and this is Jesus, Christ, the risen, exalted Lord, and and He's the one who's talking here. And so it's going to be the, it's going to be the content of this. Let me just make sure that I don't make a mistake here. Um, yeah. So I actually don't like how. That's interesting. Thus says, but it should be the words of him who has. Yeah, I'm not That's sure not, what- you, you don't have the ESV, right? Yeah, I guess I use, I guess I trans, I copied a different translation. It should yeah. be the, 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 the words, right? It should say the words. Correct. Yes, yeah, so I think it's actually the CSV. So that that's not, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Um, um, no, I, it's not the word of God that I don't like. It's the, the translation decision. So um, this, should, but, and, and I think that if, if you look, this is a, an example where you'd want to check other translations. So this thus really should be the words, the words. The words of him. Yeah. And so it's, it's, this is the action, actually. The action that's being written are the words uh, of Jesus, the words of Jesus. Okay, so everyone's tracking there. I, I guess yeah. they've. I guess they've used these two words, and but literally, it's the words of Him. So it should be the words of Him. Um, that really makes it clear and strong. Okay, and then of course the indirect object is going to this, like last time, it's going to this uh, angel, or we could say messenger. 
and and it's and it's the goal is going to the to church in Pergamum. Okay. Uh, I have a couple a couple facts about Pergamum. So let me just say a couple couple things here. It's a city in Western Asia. It's located 24 kilometers from the Aegean Sea. So it's really on the west, west side. It's near Smyrna, not so far from Smyrna. It has this imperial cult, meaning to say that the imperial cult is the, 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 the cult connected with the, the worship of the emperor. And so um, that's somewhat of an interesting context for what we'll see, what transpires as far as who's thrown, <laughs> who's thrown, who's thrown are they really worshiping? Who's really on the throne? In this imperial cult, um, pun pun intended, pun intended by the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is a pun intended. Um, any other comments before we move on to verse number thirteen? So, so the implication of a double-edged sword is that ah, it yeah. cuts yeah. it cuts both ways. Could you could you elaborate on how it does that? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, a a double-edged sword is incredibly dangerous diva because it has the edge on both sides so whether you're you know when people would like swing it it's like you it's very hard to you have to like like once you swing you've got to really set yourself back up to go again but if you can just swing back and forth it's incredibly dangerous So no, this is really good. So that means so, you cannot, you can never win. You cannot never, you, you never miss it. Yeah, you can. <laughs> very powerful and very dangerous. So you have this sharp, uh, sharp, and it's two-edged sword. This is the description of of the words of Jesus, actually. So look back, look back at, uh, look back at the vision in chapter one look back at your vision in chapter one verse 16 go ahead read some, uh, pa pastor read it uh 116 he had he had seven stars in his right hand a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was shining like the sun at midday <laughs> so <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm getting goosebumps. So God's Jesus' power in his, is in his mouth, is in is in his words. And so there's other metaphors, there's other images of, of um, the Lord, anthropomorphic images, but but fundamentally the power of God comes from his mouth that's how god designed it um and so so we, we cannot overlook it's not as if jesus is talking these words and he has another knife or he has another form of punishment the power is coming from the words himself it's it's uh his power is exercised from his word is everyone tracking there with that yeah, and um, another example of that is the word of God in Hebrews 4.12 being yes. the double-edged sword that pierces our hearts. Can you read, do you have that opened up, Amy, or no? Um, I do, hold on here. I quick looked up. Okay, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Okay, good. So that that is a little bit, it, it is a little bit hard to pick up there. Let me let me read it again in, in another translation because I because I yeah, want to. I'm not sure which one this was. <laughs> no, it's okay. Exactly. It's okay. No, it, it's fine. It's not a problem. So I just, I, I want to, I'm going to read 12 and 13 so you can pick up on this. And this is something that I believe with all my heart before I was a little waffling on this. Like I, you know, you, you don't, you want to be careful. You're not making an interpretation that um, other people do not have because, you know, you could be outside of, 
of of um, orthodoxy, but but I'm becoming very strong in this interpretation. Hebrews 12, uh, 4, 12, and 13. For the word of God, so we're thinking word of God, written word, we're thinking that, okay? For the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Watch this. And no creature is hidden from his sight. <laughs> But all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so there is the word of God. We're thinking it's written and then it like transforms to like a judge. Does everyone see that there? See that it just like it seamlessly flows to like you're going to have to be you will be judged by it. Um, and so in Hebrews. The, the author of Hebrews makes a very strong point at the outset that God has spoken through his son. And, and, and my understanding is that this word of God, of course, it includes, we can't put a dichotomy between the written word and, and Jesus Christ because he's the living word. But here the focus is really upon the warning that Jesus is that word. And it's him that we're going to have to give an account and we're seeing that really brought into reality in a very clearer and stronger way. Maybe it's more clear, clearer, clearer, more clear. I, I, I'm lost there. Um, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. So I really hope that everyone sees that. And it's powerful that, um, and, and this speaks to our devotions. This speaks to our personal life. This speaks to our evangelism. That, that the word of God is not, is not part, but fundamental uh, to the Christian life. I hope everyone sees that. It's not a part. It's not an aspect. It's not one, you know, it's not one component, component on the side. You know, some people say, you know what, you know, I worship, I spend more time in prayer. No, the, the word of God is central to the Christian life for our health and also for um, so that we're approved one day. <laughs> Anyone else want to add? Yeah. Can, you, can yeah. you actually, you know, the whole idea of the double, double edged, could it also be interpreted as like the physical and the spiritual, like both kind of realms, not, you know, not just looking at one, like you could talk about the word in a physical sense and Jesus in a spiritual sense or, or the, the, the heart and uh, the, the mind and the heart as a physical and, and spiritual. Yeah. I don't know. Because you you're talking about the yeah. marrow there and the, the joint yeah. and the marrow. It's like physical, but then the heart is the mind, is the spiritual. I, I don't know. Yeah, no, th that's, a great, that's a great observation, Luigi. That's a great observation. And what I would say is that there's... That's not Luigi. I'm sorry. <laughs> so It's all right. It doesn't Sylvia. matter. Silvio, um, the point in, in Hebrews 4 is that listing all those different things, that's actually a, a, a type of, it's a literary device called a merism. And so it's listing several different things, indicating that nothing, can, no part can be hidden. Nothing, whether physical, whether spiritual, it, 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 it goes, uh, it go, it, everything's exposed, okay? Um, so, so for sure, you're correct that the spiritual would be included in that idea. Going back to the double-edged sword, I, I think it's just in the power. I think because remember, it's a physical image that's teaching us a spiritual truth. So it's like a metaphor. So the, the word of God is, is, is metaphorically being compared to a sharp double-edged sword. And so in the, in the, in the, in the, in the first century, this would be like the most powerful weapon someone could could could, could wield, right? You know, um, maybe maybe in our twenty first century day, it could be like a a laser guided a laser guided missile, or like a or or something of that of that nature um, that someone could hold, um, you know, or a sniper rifle or something that 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 you can't escape. It is the point. It's powerful. It's gonna get you. Your option is your option is is to submit or or pay the price. 
that that's what's being emphasized here yeah like uh it's like a lightsaber <laughs> yes lightsaber that's yeah. even better i think the uh the uh, uh the, the reason why they use the double-edged sword is like uh because the word of god really is really sharp when it when, when it's when it speaks to you it's really it really cuts to the heart you know it will really convict you you know of, uh, if you find out the truth and and of all the gospel writers i think john is the one that always refer, refers to the word like you know in john chapter one in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so he's very very particular you know in using the word as a uh, one of his uh metaphors or representation of, of, of the lord so yeah that's why no, that's really is good. It, that, yeah. Is it also because that you said uh, the word of Jesus is the truth? The word of God is the truth. And who else can say against the truth if it is the truth that the ultimate thing is the truth? Yeah. So it is uh, even, even the devil knows the truth, that he is the truth. So it's just a double edge. It's like it can, it just like, they can kill you or they can, just like when he said rise, Lazarus, he rose, you know. But yeah. when he told the, the demon to go away, it's very powerful. Just he scared to, he was so scared to run away because he was yeah. so scared of when Jesus yeah. told him to yeah. go away. So yeah. that's so, how powerful yeah. the word is because yeah, no, it is the truth. Yeah, no, that's really good, Atibari Tess. And so... I like what you're bringing up there because, because it's not as if Jesus is speaking on the authority of someone else and he's limited to, okay, wait, let me go ask. And then you come back, right? Everyone works. Yeah. It's like you have authority, but you still have, even though you have authority at work, at home, you know, you still have to go ask the boss, right? So for me with, with home, homely things, I'll say, I'll, hang on, I have to go ask my wife, right? Because she's not. Yeah. <laughs> but but the here, ultimatum. Yeah, but here, the truth is from Jesus. The word, the, the yeah. final word is from Jesus. And so there is no like, okay, I'm going to appear, I'm going to, I'm going to try to bypass Jesus's warning. It's like, no, yeah. it's, this is it. There's nothing else. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent observations. Good. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to verse number 13. So be looking at verse 13 as I break it out for us. Okay, so I've kind of broken it out a little bit for us there. You can see the verse the verse there that we, we have before us. So um, what is striking? What are some repetitive words, both good and possibly bad, that we've already seen? So one thing to be thinking about is that Revelation is going to have these key words that just continue to come back. And, and, and as you read through Revelation, th those key words, just, just the, the meaning is filled up. So in many ways, it's it's very, it's a bad reading to just pick up different places in Revelation read because you're missing the use of those words in the preceding context. It's really important to read Revelation through its entire context. So what are some of those words that we see here that have already been used? Uh, let's talk about let's talk about that. What what are some significances here? Actions, objects, warnings. I know. Yeah, I was waiting. Frank, I remember you, you brought that up before. So Frank, Frank has his eye on the ball. This knowing statement here. So this, so Frank, this is for the, the million dollar question. If you get this, you get the gold star for today. Uh, we described in the past, uh, hold on. This is of course, this is of course referring to this is referring to Jesus, but, but Jesus as what? What, what, what role did we identify this knowing, 
uh, assessing what role do we do we see Jesus here taking up? What's that role? Uh, a, a judge? Yeah. Excellent. So he's in he's in his judge. He has his judge hat on right now. His garb. Um, excellent. So what are the things? What are the things that Jesus knows about them? What are some things that Jesus knows about them? Everything. Okay. Everything. Yeah. Okay. Everything. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, but so uh, let's let's <laughs> let's focus it. Let's focus it a little bit here. But that's good. It, it is that is a true statement. <laughs> but what what specifically here, Atimari test in this context, or, or anyone? What are the specific uh, things I sh that that Jesus highlights? He, Jesus is highlighting. Oh, uh, he knows where even the Satan sits. He knows yeah, where everybody yeah. are, including Satan. He even know exact position what he is sitting on. That's that's how he knows everything. So he knows. The object of his of of his knowing is in fact uh, their location, right? So he yes. knows, it, you know, you know the comedy expression. You don't know me, right? You don't know me. You don't know where I'm from, right? That's often stated when someone feels like they're being judged and they're saying, "You don't know my experience," right? Um, and Jesus' mm -hmm. statement is, I know where you live. And then he's going to clarify that. So this is the clarification. The clarification is, is where Satan's throne is. And this is the imperial cult we taught, we mentioned in the background. Yeah. So this, this, this affects all areas of life. So it's not a small uh, false religion. It influence it affects them on a daily basis. Um, good. So number one, he knows where they live. That that they're holding on to their faith. Yeah. So no, this is really good here. So they're holding to their faith, and specifically, this is my name. So this would be another way of, this is an action. This holding on to my name, this is faith right here. Okay, does everyone see that? This is faith. The object is the name of Jesus. Okay. So this would be, this would be a second object that Jesus knows about them. They are, they are trusting in Jesus, okay? They are trust, so we can say this is um, trusting in Jesus. So not, so not only does Jesus know their context, but he also knows their, so can we say he knows their heart? Can we say that? I think we can. I really think we can. So, yes. so we can say he knows their heart. So we're moving from an observation to an interpretation, okay? So this is this might be a good way to preach or teach, right? So he knows their location. He also knows their heart. They did not deny him. Yeah. So so it's it's more than just a, a it, it, it's more than just the good times. Let the good times roll. It's more than that, right? It's they did not deny him. Uh, they did not deny your face. So th this is where the rub really comes in, right? So this would be object number, object number three. So not only are they believing, but they're, but they're refusing to renounce their faith. And look at this, look at this. There's going to be this clarification here. This describes Antipas. 
And th so this is descript number one, description number one, and two. So what, what's happening here is they are experiencing, what can we say here? They're not denying their faith in spite of, what's the word? What's the key word that we could use? Persecution. Hmm. Uh, severe persecution. This is not social persecution. This is severe persecution, okay? And we can say faithful. Faithful in spite of i guess that's so this was, is was antipas was martyred was antipas yeah. martyred i guess yes martyred yeah martyred yeah. So and so here's the, good good so in the face of saying in the face of someone being martyred used as an example they still held to their faith right yeah and actually martyred the crazy thing is martyred comes from from the the greek martus which is literally witness so how crazy is that martyr became became because so many christians died for their faith that became an eventually an english word that was used to describe losing dying but but this word literally literally to martyr means originally witness literally witness it's powerful. It, it speaks to the power of the church standing faithfully for Christ, uh, even to death. Now, look here. In, in Ephesus, they had some really good works, outward works, but their heart was not correct. Okay, their heart was not good. Their heart was not good. And, and, so, and so there was a warning. The church of Philadelphia... They're just experiencing this persecution, but their heart is good. And, 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 and Jesus says just to remain faithful. Here, it's very similar to Philadelphia, right? They're, they're dealing with extreme persecution. They're holding to their faith. They're not renouncing their faith. But there are some things that the judge will not overlook. There are some things that the judge will not overlook. Go ahead. Did you, did you mean Smyrna, not Philadelphia? I'm sorry. Yes, Smyrna. I, I was thinking. I was thinking where you were. I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Smyr and Smyrna. Thank you for that correction. So let's look now, let's look now at verse 14. Verse 14. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites, to, to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So what, what is the problem? What is the issue here? Uh, he, he gives them the good, and then it's but the bad. It's the bad. Okay. The bad. No, that's good. Let's write that down. That, that's that's it because that's typically that's also a pattern that's forming, right? So that's a great pattern to uh, identify. Okay. Sorry, I was hearing some feedback. All right, so we have the commendation, and now he's going to give the bad, the, the, the rebuke, right? The rebuke here. So, so what is that? What are some things? What are some things? Let's make the observation of what those things are, and then let's, let's, make, a, let's make practical, some practical observations. Um, uh, maybe I'll get us going here. The, the first thing I want to see, I want us to see here is that this here, uh, this here is, the, the, we have to remember the context is, the context is the church.
Sorry, I was, I was going to say, so based on that, the, the fact that it's the church, is he recognizing that there's like uh, pagan rituals and yeah, so, activity of that nature? No, so that's good. So there's definitely is, there's issues in the church. We're going to see pagan, pagan issues, uh, Luigi. But my point for highlighting this is that we can't view this as in individual loss of salvation, individual, oh, you were in and now you're out. Does everyone, is everyone tracking there with me? That's not what's going on here. This is not an issue where, you know, oh, well, they have faith, but they got this other sin that they're not getting. So then the faith isn't enough. Okay. So that's not what's going on. What most likely is going on is the church is composed of believers and unbelievers. The church as a whole can be described as remaining faithful but there's sin in the camp. And so that doesn't, that doesn't deny the possibility that there's individuals in the church that are not believers. It's a mixed congregation is what I'm trying to get at. There's the, the, the church is always a mixed congregation. That, that is a hard thing for us to accept, but that is, that is the reality that there's always someone in the church as a whole that's that are unbelievers. Okay. Is everyone tracking there with me? So here we go. Good. Okay. So here we go. So there's a few things. There's a few things that they, they need to, to address. And so the, the main idea here is that there are those who are holding to the teaching of Balaam. How can we, using Christianese, what can we say here? Heresy? Yes. So we can say here this is heresy, or we could say, um, you know, heresy is, is yeah, so we could, we could say that, or we could say, uh, let's, let's use a more, uh, let's just say a, a false doctrine. Can we just say that? That, that would be maybe an easier way and, and uh, clear, more clear, clearer. I'm always messing. Is it clear or clearer? Yes. Yeah. Is it it's clear. Clearer, clearer, not more clear, clearer. My English has gone downhill. <laughs> Sorry, I'm embarrassed. I think either I, one would work. Okay, all right, whatever. It is what it is. You know, we're not professionals here. <laughs> um, right, so, so, so what we can say here is that people say, you know, there's often a, this is a practical, there's often a dichotomy that people will say, you know, faith, love, doctrine. What I'm trying to get at here is people, people will sometimes emphasize this. They will emphasize this. And then they say the doctrine isn't as important. It doesn't matter as much. Maybe some will say it doesn't matter at all. You know, you know, I'm, you know, the church is split over doctrine and this and that. And, you know, now there is different kinds of doctrine. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not right now. I'm not assessing what doctrine should be, should be in or should be out. What I'm simply saying here is that doctrine literally, doctrine literally means teaching. Okay. The Greek word is the same. Okay. It's synonymous. All right. What I'm trying to get at here is that doctrine matters. Okay? Everyone tracking with me? Doctrine matters. And so people who say that, you know, don't worry about doctrine, let's just have faith and love. Jesus, Jesus cares about our doctrine. Okay? Jesus is concerned with bad teaching in our churches. I'm saying it as a whole. I'm not... I'm not accusing ICF. I'm not accusing of any churches. I'm just saying as a principle, doctrine and right teaching matters, okay? Now, what is this teaching that is so um, problematic? What's going to happen here is Balaam... Balaam, everyone is familiar. We don't have time to go there, but Balaam is a, is a prophet. 
in the Old Testament in Numbers. You can go there. You can look up the cross-reference. It's easy to find. Balaam, it's described here in this text, so that's why we're not going to go back there. We don't have time to. Balaam is this prophet. He is going to be this, this uh, it's going to be an illustration for what's happening in the church. Okay, everyone tracking there? So people say, oh, you know, we have to try to get to all the, you know, they try to go beyond what the, the text, they're just emphasizing what is the teaching of Balaam that was so wrong, okay? So we don't have to really speculate. We're on solid ground because it's shared right here. So who is Balaam and what did he teach, okay? Balaam is the person who, so, so watch the, the, the connecting word here. The connecting word here is the word teach, okay? Balaam is the one, he's the one who taught Balak to do something, okay? What he taught Balak, the king, this is the king, what he taught him to do was to put a stumbling block before Israel. And what is that stumbling block? This is the, this is the um, clarification, or we could say being very specific, okay? What is that? Number one, meat sacrifice to idols. Number two, commit sexual immorality. Why, why is offering meat? sacrifice to idols so big why is meat offered to to, to a sacrifice to idols so well let, let's finish this let's finish this relationship first before we discuss let's be thinking about why it's such a big deal because debop um paul seems to make it not such a big deal in corinthians correct Everyone tracking there with me? Um, okay. All right. So, in, so then this here is going to be. So this is the. Let's just let's just big picture here. Okay. So this is the illustration that's going to explain the context. So the catch word here is in the same way, in the same way you have, you have those, and then who are holding to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So what I want us to see here is that the teaching of the Nicolaitans this is analogous here. So people debate, who are the Nicolaitans? How, how can we know? How can we be certain? It doesn't matter. What matters is that we have, we have the examples here that are given, and then they're, they're, they're being applied in their context. So it's, it's just like they're doing it here, you're doing it here. Okay, is everyone tracking with what's going on? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, missed, I missed the point. So, 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 so now that we have this big, we have this big relationship here, let's, let's look at this meat sacrifice to idols because i'm sorry that was that was the reason for my focus there um let's look at this meat sacrifice to, why is this such a big deal why do you think it's a big deal meat sacrifice to idols because paul says it's not here here it's a big deal it's like is, it, is there a mistake how does this work go ahead it wasn't the word idol and it's a Oh, in Exodus oh. chapter 20, you know. Go ahead, go ahead. Elaborate. Because you shall have no other gods than me. Yeah. That's the command of God. And then if yeah. you start, if there's the word idol, it's 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 your God other than the, the God. So yeah. so anything related to that idol is not acceptable to God. 
No, yeah. So that's so you're absolutely correct. I guess I guess so. What I'm you're you're absolutely right, um, Pastor Noel. So the issue that I, I'm trying to tease out, we would agree with that. It's just that in Dubai, in Corinthians 10, Paul says, "We know there's no other gods. You know, go ahead and eat the meat if no one tells you. Be, you know, but if, if someone there has a conscience, you know, you should not eat because you could cause them to stumble." Do you remember? Do you remember the passage? So so what I what, what my question is. There seems to be a slight uh, apparent, not real, but apparent difference because here it's a stumbling block. No one should partake in, in, in the church of, of Pergamum. No one should partake. But in, in Paul's day, it's like, you know, oh, well, if no one knows, go ahead. You know what I'm saying? Does everyone see that? Does everyone see that difficulty? So what I'm trying to say is, is I think you're on the right track, Pastor Noel, as far as the idols. Maybe tease that out a bit. Can you tease that out a bit? But um, I think um, the one in Corinthians are not really sacrificed to idols, right? It's like a, it's a, those are the meat sacrificed at the temple, right? If I'm not mistaken. So it's not okay. really sacrificed to the idols. These are these are the idols of uh, of, of Balaam, I think. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So it's like a, it's like so so the difference here for sure is a. These, this meat is, is, is publicly sacrificed. It, it's, 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 it's clear. It's in your face idolatry and the people are partaking. Right. Right. Pastor Noel, is, is that what you're emphasizing? Yeah. That, yeah. That's what, yeah. That's what yeah. Like, so, yeah. So, yeah, no, exactly. You're right. And so in, in Paul's day, it's, it's not as clear. It's just like they were used or somehow they're connected, but then it's just in the public market here. This is really, this is, in this context, this is public, public participation. Um, in, in idol worship. So they, so they are, and this is probably in connection with the imperial cult. And what would actually be required is, um, without going to all the different background, is, is, a, is that different social uh, organizations of the day, they would require you to go and take um, meat, sacrifice it. And, and it was, it was I, I think, the, 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 however else Paul is, is addressing in, in Corinth, it's not public. It's not in your face, okay? And it's for sure not clear idolatry, okay? Maybe you're right. It's sacrificed in some way. There's some connection. But now the, 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 the meat has been brought to the market. It's being sold. We don't really know where it's coming from. Yeah, you can partake. It's not a big deal. Here, this is, this is really, this is public participation in, in, in a false, in a false religion. So that their allegiance is not to Christ, but to this idol, okay? Or maybe they are trying to, uh, they're shooting in both directions, you know, just to be sure. They are yep. compromising. They may yes. have, they probably have the faith in Christ, but at the same time, they're also participating on this because they're, they're part of the, the church in, uh, in, in, uh, in Pergamum. Yeah. Right. So there are some yeah. of you. So they are they are part they are part of the church in Pergamum, but they are compromising their faith, you know, with participation of this idol worship. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's like and 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 you have issues there in this day where people say, you know, I practice my faith secretly, but publicly they're still associating with the false religion in their local context. And what 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 what's being said here is that that's not. That's not acceptable. That's not acceptable. Um, and, and there's many passages in, in, in Matthew 10. Jesus says, the one who denies me publicly before men, I will deny before my father. There is this call to, to acknowledge Christ before men publicly. There is this public declaration that everyone knows who you are. Um, you know, and so this is, the, this is one issue. The other issue is to commit sexual immorality. Okay? So then... So then my question for us is, in our day, where is the application for this in our day? Do we have it in our day? 
What about the town fiesta in the Philippines? Yeah, it could be. Absolutely, where you're participating in the in the, the local fiesta that's celebrating the Pina Francia, that's celebrating the, 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 the local icons of the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church. And I'm not saying that all Catholics are not Christians, but when you, uh, um, there is a lot of idolatry and wrong idolatry in the Philippine context. And so that, that could be an example. That's, that's a great example. Uh, now, Tim, the sexual immorality here is like practiced in the name of religion, right? No, no. So, so uh, when you look at, and maybe that's maybe that's maybe that's one interpretation. When you look at the analogy with Balaam, Diba, it was just he said the way we're the the way you can, I can't curse, I can't curse Israel. He told that to Balak. I can't curse Israel. God has forbidden me from cursing Israel. So the way you're going to get God to curse Israel is you have to make them sin. <laughs> that was the sin. So what, ba so, what, so what Balaam said was the way you're going to get Israel to stumble is you have to make them sin, then God will curse them. And so he said, you know, um, the, 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 the big sin, you know, um, I think there was also... Um, I don't know about the meat sacrifice to idols as much. The focus of, of Balaam was causing Israel to participate. Yeah, I think it was. It was to participate in the false, the false religions and to have sex with, with, uh, with, with Gentiles, with, with, with Balaam's women, Balak's women, right? If you go back and look at that context. And so when they, when they were having intercourse with people outside, the, the, the wrath of God fell upon them. So that's, that's the sense. And so I would say it's more general. It's just tolerating and permitting and even encouraging sexual immorality. So it's, it's not just it's, really, really, really just form of sexual immorality, but yeah, it's it, in I, general. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, I, 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 my interpretation would be, and, and maybe that, that's not black and white, but I think that looking at Bal Balaam's context and this context, I think that's the case. And if that's the case, Pastor Noel, we have that in the church, Diba. In the church, the churches are tolerating sexual immorality in the church. They're not, they're not, some churches are not preaching against it. There are people that are, that, you know, especially I'm thinking more in the youth, the, the younger generation where there's a lot of churches, they accept the, the youth and singles going around and sleeping and, and various things. And they're not speaking against it, you know, because it's this new culture. It's acceptable culturally. So this is where, Looking at our culture, this is what I want, to, I want us to see here, okay? Um, in our day, in our day, the culture is, uh, is secularism. And, and it's also in, um, in uh, no guilt. Um, and it's like a, it's like a free a free sex culture, right? Col sex is not considered wrong in our, in our culture, correct? And, and secularism is also worshipped. So this would be secularism or a denial of, of uh, just a general denial of theism. So academia denies, and so this is this is strong this is something that we have to this is something that we have to work with our youth with the next generation that they're in academia they're in the college they're in the university and they're they will not share their faith because because they will be laughed at and so outwardly they tolerate they even outwardly maybe embrace secularism to get by they're not known as a christian that's uh, that's that's the imperial worship of our day this idea of you'd be surprised at how many christians it's like they're having sex especially the the the, the, the singles and it's just we just ignore it it's like that's part of the culture and we just don't it's like a don't ask don't tell type policy in our churches and so you know now i'm not again i'm not targeting a specific church i'm just saying the church generally um but that's something that we need to be considering so what is the response? Is the response, you're damned, 
no, no chance. You're gone. Get him out of here. You know, what's the response? What's the response here? The response is repent. Whenever, whenever people say, oh, you're judging me, this and that, there's no hope. You're just, you know, you're condemning me. No, there's always a chance. We love you. What should you do? Repent. <laughs> Believe. Repent. Um, but watch this. So, Go ahead. So, are you saying that uh, this my, I was just thinking. So, in the beginning, the, the, the Church of Pergamum, they are like faithful ones there. They endure, like, even in, in the midst of persecution, they endure, said that you hold on to my name, yeah. kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, there yeah. are some of you, you know, there yeah. are some of you who are practicing such and such. Yeah. And then when, 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 when the Lord said, repent, it is, uh, is it the whole church or just those who are compromising their faith? Yeah, the no, reason, great. Yeah, go ahead. The reason why I'm asking is if, if if it's the word repent is for the whole church, does it mean that that those who are faithful ones who are holding on to the name of the Lord are kind of because of their tolerance, or I don't know if they're tolerating yeah. those ones, or because of the others mixed in their in their congregation, which are practicing the the the, the, the Balaam's theology. They're all yeah. guilty of it. Yeah. That's so like not saying repent. Yeah. yeah. So 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 I think it's I think it's both an individual and a corporate, and I think that's your question, right? I think it's individual that that there are specifically ones there that are eating and committing, okay? But then there's another level where they're tolerating the teaching. So so there there are those that are engaging. There are those that are teaching. So, so let's just let's just draw out the church really quick here. Let's draw out the church here. If you can imagine here the, the church. This is the church. There are those that are, um, this is the church here. And then there are those that are practicing. So there are those that are practicing. There are those that are teaching. They're, they're, they're teaching it. They're saying it's okay, right? And for sure, there's probably an overlap here, right? So they're probably those that are teaching are also practicing. <laughs> and then what I would say is that the whole church is tolerating. The whole church is tolerating this. Because if they were not, they would have removed those. The, the, the church practice is always to, to deal with the sin and to, and to remove those that are unrepentant, Okay. So, so everyone is culpable here in some sense. There are those that are practicing. There are those that are teaching and possibly practicing too. And then the, then the whole church is tolerating. So to answer your question, Pastor, my understanding is yes, <laughs> all of the above. And so it, it, it's a comprehensive, I'm sorry for that mess up here. So the, 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 the command is to, is to repent And then this is a warning. Everyone sees that warning there? He will come and then he's going to fight. And again, this is the this is to the church. This is this is a this is a in, in, in the in the first the first warning in Ephesus it was the church that he was going to remove the lampstand. Does everyone remember that? And so here again he's going to fight with them, but it's in a corporate, it's in a corporate setting. What I want to, this is the reason why I'm saying that is that it's not that individuals that are truly believers can lose their salvation. That's, this is so critical to understand. Okay. This is not to let the church off the hook. It's not to let those that are sinning off the hook, but it is to say that those that are true believers, th this is not a reference to, okay, you were a true believer, but you sinned, you messed up, you're done, you're out, God's gonna, Christ is going to destroy you, okay? This is, this is in a, this is a corporate context, okay? And any comments or questions? I hope that's making sense. I, I don't want to be confusing here. So what you're saying is even the command to repent is to the, is to the corporate as well 
Yeah, there, there's a time when there is a time, and you never see this anymore. But there's a time when the church is the church as a body has not been faithful. There's a time for there to be a public confession um, as a church, and actually, you know, in in some churches, there's actually a regular practice where the church they confess their sins corporately. So, um, you know, and, and maybe that's something that 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 we want to consider more that's more in like reformed presbyterian circles you don't see that as much in like baptist pentecostal circles but this corporate co confession of sin as a as a church body on sunday they'll just have a time of you know we can not specific but just generally confessing sin now here is specific this would be specific but on what i'm trying to say is the practice of of just confessing sin as 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 a body of believers is, is practice. You'll have the pastor that will just, uh, there'll be a time of confession. Maybe, maybe the people will just pray and confess their sins privately. And then, and then the pastor just leads a prayer of confessing corporate sin, because, you know, just as individual sin, no church is perfect as, as a body, we sin, right? Um, is everyone tracking there with me? And I'm not saying we need to do that. I, I mean, it's, it's for the church to decide, but that, that is a good practice to have okay we're done here we're almost done here so then the last statement is he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches so we're going down to the last verse here and this is i have a question go ahead go ahead go ahead, go ahead. so the warning right is to repent yeah and then can you go back to that to that verse on the screen yeah, yeah. okay go ahead yeah so repent, otherwise I will come quickly and fight fight against them. So why why is them is the uh, the pronoun is ah okay them. Let, me, let me see let me think here. Yeah, so it seems to be it seems to be targeting those that are sinning. So so it's not yes yeah, so, so no, that's 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 a good clarification. Let me just let me just make sure, let me just see something here. Repent for against them with the word about yeah so no so that's really good that's a really good observation that's a really good observation here okay so um uh so here the the them and that actually would clarify some things because he's not he's not going to destroy the believers with the unbelievers he's not going to fight against the believers with the unbelievers is, is, is that is that what you're trying to, to highlight pastor yeah it's like uh it's like this, uh, Tim, you repent or else I will destroy Luigi. It's like, so what, what, what is the warning about there? So, so if I want them to be destroyed, then I will repent. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm making sense yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so let me just make, let me, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Yeah. So, so, so. It's, like that, it's not like I will fight against you. If you don't repent, you will be accountable. It's like, if you don't repent, they will be accountable. Some, if I'm understood correctly, the uh, the form of the sentence, you know. So I was just. Yeah. So so no no so 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 fair enough. Let me. I'm trying to think. So you know how like Daniel, Daniel prays a prayer. Nehemiah prays a prayer. R remember the great prayers of Nehemiah. Even I think David. I think David, where they lead the people in a prayer of confession. Okay. So everyone is. It, so, so the leader is praying the prayer. Okay. So, uh -huh. so, so e even, even Daniel prayed a prayer confessing he includes himself in Israel, but in the judgment of Israel, it, 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 God is not actually fighting against Daniel, right? He's not actually fighting against Nehemiah. Did you see what I'm saying? So, so when I was referring to this corporate context of confessing sin that's the sense in which I, in, in which we, in, in, in which I'm, um, I'm referring to. Okay, so your clarification is is really good in the sense that I'm not, I was not meaning to say that God would, um, that Jesus would come and and like actually destroy, and judge, the faithful Christians. Okay, but I I, I do think that there is this, because it doesn't say. Notice here, it's it's fight against them, right? So, so look here. There's this fight against them, but the repent is is more general, okay? Um, 
So I, I just, I, I think this repent, this repent, of course, it's focused on the sinner, but in one sense, because the church is in view, I think there is this idea, this idea of, and maybe you disagree with me, okay, but I think there is this idea of the, the corporate in, in line with um, um, uh, uh, Solomon's prayer. Um, I think David, I'm messing this up now. I, I'm pretty sure David, um, uh, Daniel, and I, is it, is it, is it, who is the religious leader? Nehemiah is the, Nehemiah, Ezra is the, the, Ezra is the religious leader and Nehemiah is the governor. Is that correct? I don't want to misspeak. Is that correct? Yeah. But, but, but the fighting is targeting specifically at those who are sinning. Yes. Yeah. yeah so no. So, so, and, and, and that's a great clarification. I guess that was what I was, I wasn't clear on that. So, so yeah. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, I was not in any way implying that if they don't repent, God's going to destroy them all. Okay, that's not what I was meaning to imply. But there is this call for, for, for a general repentance and then a warning of specific judgment of those who are really engaging in sin. Yeah. So, yeah, just, yeah. Like, uh, just like, you know, when I was in the Philippines, we, the church, we have a group of pastors and, and church like, uh, we will pray for repentance for the sake of the nation yeah. because the nation is sinning against God. So the church is not, I mean, you know, but we are pray, we are doing a, like a corporate repentance, repentant prayer for the whole nation. Yeah. Not just for, uh, no. Yeah. And, and, and so, the, so no, like, and, and if there, if there's a sorry repentance kind of thing, you know, what was that? Like uh, intercessory kind of yes, uh, inter no, exactly, in exactly, gap. yes. It's like the church is standing in the gap between God and the sinners, yeah. and then you are like interceding for the sinners to God that God yeah. please don't destroy them. We repent, we yeah. repent for them, kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. So, so let let's look at because th this prayer here I think is a perfect example. This is Ezra's prayer about intermarriage. So. Israel is engaged in intermarriage. They've just come back out of the exile and they're already sinning. They're already sinning like the devil. They just got out of exile and they're back to it. But look at how Israel, look at how Ezra prays. And this is, this is this, this is the sense in which I think the passage is referring to here. And also what pastor Noel is really highlighting. And I, and I really appreciate that. Oh my God, verse number six. Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to my, to lift my face to you. Oh my God. For our iniquity. So do you see how he's with the people, even though he's not the one sinning? Our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to shame. And that's the punishment of God. So God has judged Israel um, and so the judgment has fallen upon everyone, even though, even though there are righteous, even though Ezra is not participating in that. Okay. Um, but now for a brief moment of favor has been shown by the Lord, our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place that our God might brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery for we are slaves yet God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love. Grant to us some reviving to set up the house of God, to repair the ruins, and to give us um, uh, protection in Judea and Jerusalem. So, so this is it's this prayer of confession, this, this prayer of blessing. And then he continues to go on and on and on. He talks about the uncleanliness. Um, there's more great guilt in verse 13. Um, and so verse, verse 15, Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. And so... Chapter 10, and Israel pray, Ezra prayed and made a confession and weeping and casting him down, casting down himself. So I think this is the context that we should be considering in, in reference to this. I think it's, I think it's, it's not even that, it's not even that Jesus is thinking specifically of that. It's just an analogous appropriate, it's an analogous appropriate comparison. Is everyone tracking there with me? So great. 
Thank, thank you, Pastor Noel. That was that was a very good insight. I really appreciate that. Excellent, really good. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so well, let's end here. So here again, we have this this statement um, of uh, him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, this is a this is a call a call to uh, to read hear. And obey. So right, it's written. So then they've they've heard it. Uh, someone reads it, they hear it, and they obey it. Okay, this is this is the idea of this call here. And then this is a promise. Promise number one. And promise number two. Promise number one and promise number two. Um, and so the the hidden manna. The hidden manna, uh, what is that? Um, in the previous context, what was similar to the hidden manna? What, what was a similar reference to, to this in the previous context? Is that the tree of life? Yeah, the, 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 fruit, the fruit of the tree of life. So in, so in the garden and then in paradise, The fruit gives life. Okay, so that's a physical, it's a physical picture of what God will give us eternal life. Okay, so here in the same sense, you're like, well, what is the hidden manna? It, it's just, it's just a meta, it's just, an, it's just a, a picture that God's going to grant us life. So we have this in the days of Moses in the wilderness, right? It's the provision in the wilderness to live. So Tim, it's not the, the manna that's in the in the, in the ark of the covenant. Yeah. Yeah. The, the covenant is the, the manna. Yeah. <laughs> that never went bad, right? It never went bad. So this is a illustration. It's illustration. Just to emphasize, emphasize that Christ is going to give us eternal life. The focus here is this. It's a picture to remind us that we are going to be given eternal life, sustenance, eternal life. Okay. And then the, white, the, man, yes, the yes. definition of manna is uh, like bread from heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yep. And what about that white stone? So, so hold on here. Um, yeah, so I mean, like the, the commentaries, the, it's all speculation. It's all speculation. Um, they talk about being a connection with, with the manna. Um, you know, I think, I think the focus, this is, this is what I think. Number one, the focus is on this eternal life because manna was from heaven, but it was only to sustain physical life, right? In the first context. But now the, the, the hidden manna is, going to sustain us eternally. I think that's the big takeaway. And it's just an, it's, it's just an illustration to that. And the white stone with the new name, I think, I think the new name, the new name, you know, I, I, I want to focus on this. What is the significance here? Fathers give names, <laughs> right? Fathers give names. And so this is, this is a new name from our heavenly father. Uh, it reminds me of one of the, uh, I think it was Pastor Noel, the last uh, church we had, about Peter. When, um, when Jesus renamed Simon into Peter because of that rock, is it the small yeah. rock? Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. Remember that, Pastor, you said yep. that Petro means a small rock? So it could be the one that he was talking about. Like Peter, he has his own name. The small rock that named Peter, and maybe that's what the stone that we're gonna get if we go there. Our name will be written on the small rock as well, maybe a little bit smaller than Peter. <laughs> that's an interesting connection. That's a very but interesting it is a connection. white rock, remember? Yeah. It's a white rock. And if Could it's be. given to us, I will take it. Siggy, Siggy, that's the big thing. Thank that's you, the the now that you're listening to my message. Uh, I do. I take notes of it, Pastor. Thank you. So I think uh, 
Are we getting new names in head when we're there? Are we gonna we gonna have a new name? That's that's kind of my curiosity, you know. No, I think we will. I mean, I think I think I I think yeah, because yeah, I think I think so. I think that, but but that goes with our heavenly Father, right? He he names us, uh, right? So Jesus says, "I know my sheep. I know them by name." <laughs> yeah, and so there is this. Think about what type of assurance. If our heavenly father names us, right? A father names his children. And when he names his children, Sigurado, he knows them. And it's not a general knowledge, but an intimate personal knowing. And so what I, I, we, what I, what I don't want to happen in, 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 in Revelation, we, you know, the temptation, and I think this is the first of many, the temptation is to focus so much, the, 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 the temptation is to focus is to focus on the illustration. Our focus is to focus on the illustration when in reality, our focus should be upon the reality of what the illustration is teaching us. And even uh, Tim, in, in Ephesians, when Paul wrote Ephesians chapter three, yeah. for this reason, I kneel before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. You know, in Ephesians. Uh... Yeah. No. So, so that, I mean, so the other thing too, every, so what, what you're saying, pastor is really good. It name, the name there is name fundamentally is, is, is contains our identity. Viva, it contains our identity. So that's why throughout the old Testament, the name of the Lord is exalted. The name of the Lord will be proclaimed. Because fundamentally, the name contains the identity of who the Lord is. Do you see what I'm saying? And so it's our identity is not in our earthly names, but in the name that our Heavenly Father gives us. So ultimately, that identity is in Christ. Um, and maybe I'm just going all over the place. I hope that, that, that and that's drawing on the connection that I had not thought of before, but I, from what pastor said, this identity in Christ. Yeah. And, and, and that's picking up pastor. That's Ephesians. What's that's Ephesians. Three, three, Ephesians, four, and 15. Ephesians three. 14 and 15, and then also John 10, right? Referencing the great shepherd that calls his sheep. So yep. this idea that there is this, we have a name given to us by God and his son. Right? Diba? Mm -hmm. So what I want us to think about is we can debate all these specific images but we should focus on the truth that it's teaching us beyond the image. We should not be focused on the illustration, but on the truth that Amen. Jesus will give us eternal life. We have eternal life now, but, he, but he's going to sustain that eternal life forever. And number two, there is this new name that we will receive because fundamentally our identity is in, is in, Christ, is in Christ. Not ourselves, not our fallen nature, not our fallen person. So that's that's the the the, the, the conclusion. Maybe we're a little bit all over the place. I apologize. I apo I apologize if there is confusion. Um, I appreciate Pastor Noel's clarification. My intention was not to assert that God would fight against Christians, um, but I, I did want to emphasize that when there's sin in the camp, when there's sin in our families, when there's sin in our church. We should not. We should. We should identify with the sinner for for, for uh, intercessory prayer. If if I can really, if I can really um, be specific, um, and so we are interceding. And so the, in, the with Moses, with Christ, they always identified with the sinner when they interceded. <laughs> when and I, so what I, what I, what I uh, take from this is like. You know, our tendencies as human beings is to condemn yeah. the sinner, especially yeah. inside the church. How can you yeah. do that? Yeah. You know, you're a Christian, especially in the church, in a context, 
Yeah. But I think what is this teaching us is instead of doing that is we should repent for them. Yeah. I mean, the reason why the repent is generalized and the and then the fighting is a specific people is like I think the Lord is what is 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 teaching us to be more um, inclusive. You know, we, we should identify with the sinners instead of condemning com condemning them. We should like pray for them and in a way yeah. repent for them. Represent yeah. them in our prayers. You know, we can pray like, oh God, please, not that I'm not guilty, but if you know that let's say Tim is doing something sinful, you pray for them and please forgive Tim. Yeah. Have mercy on Tim. You know, it's like uh, interceding for that person. Yeah. In a way, it's a it's a it's a repentant uh, kind of prayer for the yeah. representing that person. I think that's yeah. what uh, what I take from this. Uh, that's particular. really good, Pastor Noel, and 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 I think that's a really I I think that's really good. This idea that we're more inclusive in the sense that we're not standing aside like you know casting stones. We are speaking the truth to them, and we're not excusing sin but we're really empathizing. We're coming alongside. And it's that goal of this, of this trying, uh, trying to, to stand in the gap for them. I, and I think that maybe that has been lost in the past with, with churches where there really has been this separation, you know, and that doesn't, that doesn't exclude church discipline. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not saying, but, but I really like what you're saying, this inclusivity in the sense that, we really are identifying with them, acknowledging our own sin, and then together we're repenting, we're, we're praying for their repentance. It, it's not this self-righteous um, condemnation, like, I am holier than thou, you yeah. will be damned, you know, <laughs> like that. Yeah, that's really good. Let's close on that. Let's close on that. That's good.